Do you have a massive ego? Do you love numbers? Will you die in direct sunlight? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you might be a gamer. Good, glad you're here. I've got something you might like. Don't worry, we can stay inside. After centuries of slumber and two years of early access, vampires are waking up in the world of whatever for some good old-fashioned crab bucketing, killing and conquering everyone that gets in their way. Make no mistake, you might be on the side with the big titty goth girls, but you're definitely the bad guys. Murder, poaching, and theft are the first steps you take on the ladder of power. And while no one cries over spilt bandit blood, very quickly you stop criming on criminals. Who do we have next? Finn the Fisherman and Pelora the Feywalker. Ah, vampires, mortal enemies, a fairy princess, and a dude with a hobby. I'm getting ahead of myself. You spawn in a forgotten crypt far beyond the edge of civilization, hidden deep in dark monster-infested woods, covered in rags, weak, and thirsty. Between the bandits and monsters, this forest isn't friendly, and it's clear that the humans that are here aren't by choice. What a great place to base your power. Who's going to care when a few unwashed mortals go missing? I'm sure the militia captain will be pleased to note that kidnapping and raids are down, along with fewer wolf sightings. Don't worry, Octavian, I'm doing you a favor. I promise I have no interest in your quaint little villages. Which is a lie, before long you'll be reaping fields, ambushing patrols, and stealing from people's houses. Who would have thought that the vampire invasion starts with an increase in petty theft? Pretty cool setting, right? An open world in which you can play out your own personal Castlevania. So long as you have a good imagination. The game world is stagnant. Sure, there are patrols and factions fight each other. Events pop up here and there, but the only story bits you're given are the opening cutscene and blobs of text on your map and boss ladder. Enough to clue you in on the world and its people, but... Why should I care? We're vampires. Beautiful, powerful, immortal vampires. Human lives are inconsequential. It's my party. They'll die if I want to. When it comes to a narrative, the game is more of an empty canvas over a display piece, because the point of it all is to be a vessel for boss fights. Stupid ass infinite bear! But before that, let's talk about first impressions. V Rising is a visual treat. It has a simple, gothic-inspired art style. Characters have exaggerated proportions, but not to the point that they look goofy. Everything is readable, and the animations are very fluid. Some of the models can be a bit chunky, and you'll find things that lack detail up close, but you'll rarely be zoomed in enough to notice. Not that there's no reason to zoom in, you just can't fight this way. For example, the weapons and armor are well made. Oh, you can even change its color palette and skins. Plus, there's plenty to look at inside your castle. I hope you like looking at dirt. The camera won't pan up at all. It's a shame, it'd be cool to see the world from your avatar's perspective. First we have to imagine a story, now we have to imagine a castle. Why? Everything is rendered anyway. You can get a mod to fix this, but all that tells me is that this was possible from the beginning. Was this chosen on purpose? Did they not have time? I don't know, but it's what we got. The lighting is good, as to be expected in a game where the sun matters. The nights are day, but blue. Darkness is cool and all, but since the game mostly happens at night, it's better to be functional. If people can't see in your game, they'll just crank the gamma anyway. Bright nights can be hand-waved away as having vampire eyes or whatever. The light really shines in the player's castle, since you can decide where and what color it is. And while the custom light system pales in comparison to the one in Grounded, you can still get moody with it. Needs more red. Other than that, the Blood Moon effects seem a little off. I think they're supposed to be, like, red god rays, but they look like farts. As for how the game sounds, it's alright. No, just kidding. I'm pretty picky when it comes to what I let in my ears, so if I don't have much to say about the audio, what I mean is it could be worse. 
The combat is punchy and satisfying, the voice work is above average, the ambience fills out the world well, and the music is incidental and gloomy. If you really like it, there's a music box you can make for your castle so you can set the mood while you brood. There's no bombastic tracks, and I wouldn't listen to the soundtrack on its own, but the game doesn't deserve to be muted to have your playlist run over top of it. My only real gripe with the game's audio is some of the boss's line deliveries feel off. But I'm really reaching for something to complain about. Overall, your ear holes will be pleased. Now it's time to look at the most important thing a game has before we get into gameplay. Options. Always, always, always look at the options before starting a new game. That way you can turn off motion blur. And seeing as how there are as many control schemes out there as there are gamers, bare minimum you should be able to change keybinds. If nothing else, the amount of options present will at least give you a good idea on how clued in the developers are. You can't go wrong with making your game more accessible. Thankfully there's plenty to play with here. Not only that, but before you start the game, you're given an opportunity to tweak the world settings. If you're playing single player, you should turn off bat bound and teleport bound items. These options harshly limit fast traveling. They force you to run around the world and only exist to give other players the opportunity to rob you. No point in that if you're alone. Also, if you're good at video games, do yourself a favor and play on Brutal. My first experience with the game was on normal and at no point did I ever feel as though I was in any danger, even against bosses, so I turned it up. Man, what a difference. The extra damage from regular enemies means you need to take fights more tactically, and bosses have more mechanics to the point that fighting them on other difficulties feels empty. The rest is up to you. I don't mind a bit of grinding in my games, but I'll be damned if I'm going to waste five minutes for my sword to finish crafting. Why's it got to take so long? All right, time for the game. On the surface, V Rising is an open world survival crafting sandbox but at its core it's a game about positioning and tactics. No. Knowing where to stand is crucial, especially if you take a fight during the day, and using the right tools for the job can be the difference between one-shotting a boss and 20 corpse runs. Midnight, what help me! <laughs> Then I save me. <laughs> Honestly, it feels a lot like World of Warcraft. If World of Warcraft was modernized, polished, and good, it's easy to plow through the chaff, but Zug Zug will only get you so far once enemy types diversify. Combat is cooldown based. There are no resources besides health, which, as long as you have blood, constantly regenerates to full. There is a healing cap in combat, and you're not as sturdy as one might expect a vampire to be. This will force you to retreat and reset the fights or die trying. One or two hits from a boss or half a dozen guards wailing on you will send you packing. Oh. Oh, you've come to fight me. I'm going to summon nine million gargoyles. There is no shame in retreat. Well, maybe a little. If you're that upset about it, you can always take it out on the nearby village. There are 70 combat abilities to play with, but you only have to worry about a handful at a time. Once you reach the Iron Age, each weapon has two inherent abilities. With 11 weapon types to choose from, you're bound to find something that suits you. It's possible to fit up to 8 weapons on your action bar, but the weapon skills share cooldown, so if you think you're a big brain and will hot swap weapons to make killer combos, think again. When it comes to magic, you have both spell schools and vampire powers. Most of your innate abilities are different shape-shifting forms, and these either function as a key to unlock gated areas or to assist in traversal. As for combat magic, there are six schools, each with six abilities and two ultimates to choose from. Pay attention, this will be on the test. The first school you encounter in the vampire game is the School of Blood. Surprise. This is as close to healing magic as you'll get, but don't worry, it doesn't lack for damage. Healing in this game isn't terribly powerful due to smallish numbers and the aforementioned cap in combat, but it can be enough to soften mistakes, especially in the early game. Blood is a very well-rounded school that can fit into a lot of playstyles. But what if you wanted to do a lot of damage? Chaos magic is about hitting as many things as possible as hard as possible. Tagged enemies ignite, doing damage damage over time and causing them to explode when killed. Bring your enemies low, then chain explosions together for massive area damage. For you summoners out there, or if you just like to bone, Unholy Magic summons skeletons that are great for distracting your enemies. They don't do much damage, and they die quickly, but they can still be useful, taking heat off you if you're playing solo. Unholy has fairly generic spells, but enemies hit by this magic receive an additional 15% damage from all sources until the condemned debuff wears off. I'll admit, I scoffed at illusion magic at first. Why use magic to lie when you can make someone fight their own skeleton? The spells themselves aren't as well-rounded as some other schools, but their utility should not be underestimated. Resetting and reducing cooldowns on top of decreasing enemy damage by 15% can let you take on foes outside your weight class. It also has the best dodge move in the game, resetting your position effectively giving you two dodges in one. Frost magic is great if you need to chill giving you control over the battlefield to isolate targets or give yourself a little breathing room. Enemies can't hurt you if they can't move, and between the constant slows and freezing to death, they will have an awful time getting to you. 
The damage is also respectable, and comes with a lot of shielding. Storm magic is a bit underwhelming. Its damage pales in comparison to the previous schools, but that's because of how the magic interacts with your attacks. To get the most out of it, you'll need to abuse the static effect, proccing extra damage and chaining the debuff between enemies. Fast hitting weapons are your friend. You can take any spell from any school without restriction and place it into one of two spell slots. Wait, only two? Unfortunately, yes. So many cool spells and almost all of them get benched. What a shame. Even one single extra spell slot would really round out the combat. As it stands, you'll most likely have one spot saved for defense and one for offense. Thankfully, you can swap spells at will and respec your points for free, so don't be afraid to experiment. Between the weapons and the magic, there's enough here to have fun, but it still feels like the game is limiting itself. Look at the action bar. There's even space on the right for an extra button to make it symmetrical. Oh god, the UI isn't symmetrical. Another thing I need to mention is how these spells are unlocked. You get one spell point specific to both a school and a tier when you kill a boss. Pretty straightforward, right? But wait, you're killing bosses right up to the end. What does this mean for skill unlocks? Well, you won't be filling out your spellbook until there's about four bosses left. The game is practically over. Does it really matter? No, you get plenty of points, and like I said, you can reset everything for free, but the fact that you don't get access to your entire skill set until the very end of the game seems like an oversight. Games should give you everything well before the end, so you have tons of time to play with your toys. Each spell, except for ultimates, can be enhanced by gemstones looted in the world or eventually crafted at your base. There are four tiers of jewels, and the bonuses can fundamentally change how each spell is used. For example, Ghost Wolf, a damaging projectile, might get a strong self-heal, pulling double duty as an offensive defensive spell. Other effects might range from reducing cooldowns and applying slows to cleansing debuffs and adding projectiles. The issue with these gems is that all the bonuses are randomly generated, so you have to luck your way into getting what you want. Higher level gems have more bonuses, so it's more likely you'll get something good, but you won't find or craft tier 4 gems for a while. If min-maxing is your thing, you might be off-put by all the randomness. Speaking of gambling, there's another bit of it in the game that's quite important. Every living creature has blood, but not all blood is created equal. I know that as a Lord of Darkness, you deserve nothing but the prime cuts of meat and the quenchiest of drinks, but until you find a reliable source of curated blood, it's better to have some than not. Your blood pool is constantly draining. It's not a huge inconvenience, but you will run out. This doesn't kill you. Instead, you wither down to one hit point, and you have to live with yourself, knowing that you've brought shame to your house and your line and you're a failure, and how dare you call yourself a vampire. Now, unlike in dating, here blood type matters. Most will increase your combat capabilities, but all are useful in some way. Creature blood gives moderate buffs, but isn't specialized. Worker blood helps with gathering materials. There are two flavors of fighter, warrior and brute, rogue for faster dodging and critical hits, and scholar for improved spellcasting. There's a couple more, but find them on your own time. Purity affects what bonuses you get and how powerful they are, with 100% purity increasing every single bonus. Early game, your sources of blood will be pretty limited and poor, and munching on juicy humans will be a one-time thing. You'll need to unlock guest facilities before you can have people over for dinner. Oh yeah, castles. Every vampire needs a castle, or two or five. You can only build them on designated building plots, but the map is littered with them. There are no direct benefits to any locations other than closeness to specific resources and adding your own teleports to the fast travel network, so settle where you like. From a single player perspective, they're simply a place to craft, rest, and stockpile resources. The gothic architecture is beautiful. With all the decorations and doodads available, you can make some stunning and intricate bases. Most of the detail work went here. The elaborate stonework offsets its drab colors, and like I said before, you have a lot of options to set the mood. Like yourself, castles need blood to survive and will start to deteriorate when they run out. You can turn this off. If you don't, it's not much to worry about. The timer lasts for days and you have to go out of your way to avoid picking up blood essence. You don't have to go crazy on base design if you don't want to, but you do need to build one to progress. There's no experience grinding in this game. Your stats are locked behind gear score. And the bulk, if not all of the gear, will come from crafting, which is done at home. There's some material grinding in this game, unless there isn't. But these time wasters serve the same purpose as teleport bound items, giving other players time to ruin in your day. The thing is, once you turn off a lot of these options, you find that V Rising is not a long game. There are 37 bosses, and if you rush them, you can probably beat the game casually in like a week. Beyond love for the game itself, there's no reason to play once you've reached the top. For better or worse, short games are nice because they don't take a lot of your time, but ending too quickly can make that same time feel wasted. Because so much of the game can be tweaked, your mileage may vary. Unadjusted, the game has a lot of padding, which is to enable player versus player. It is perfectly fine to treat this as a single player game, but it's clearly designed around having multiple people on a server, stomping around competing for power. Monkey climbing can be fun, just look at the popularity of battle royales. The difference here, though, is that every match in those games starts on an even playing field. V Rising has recently 
resets, but the time and frequency of it all are at the discretion of whoever is running the server. Games will naturally quiet down as whoever falls behind bails for fresher saves, leaving established vampires to gain more and more power with less and less competition. But hey, if you can't beat them, join them! Vampire clans can be a good way to stop yourself from getting steamrolled, and to inflict that pain on others. But can you trust them? <laughs> Them's the basics, but there's still many mechanics I didn't even touch on. Alchemy, research, resistances, rifts, passives, mounts, servant quests, the list goes on. If you're worried about being overwhelmed, don't be. Progression is handled well in a way that drip feeds you what you need while dangling enough juicy carrots to keep you motivated. If you're stuck, chances are what you need is behind a boss battle or up here. I'm not disparaging the game when I say it's a mile wide and two inches deep. There is just enough stuff in each system to be engaging and useful, but not too much that you need to spend days researching the ins and outs of each mechanic. I must invoke <laughs> the ancient rituals of vampires to summon my horse. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to look up any info outside of the game on my playthroughs. Sure, four heads are better than one, but the fact that we could intuit what to do without resorting to Google is a reflection of good game design. I would highly recommend this game. Even though it can be short, there's enough here and at a level of quality that I have no problem paying the asking price. Bonus recommendation if you enjoy World of Warcraft. This game will fit you like a glove. If you don't play WoW or you are scared of that comparison, don't worry. V Rising is a well-made, well-polished, and fun experience that's worth checking out. Oh god, oh shit. I miss my abilities and everything, goddamn. Get, die, 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 die